Hi. Let us do something. Let us all stand up. Again, yes, again. Jeez, again, exercises. So stand on your toes. Harder. Stretch your hands. Climb the chair. I'm joking, I'm joking. Then say, Captain, my captain, I want to grow. Uh, you can sit, you can please sit it. So in this panel, we are going to talk about growth, how to scale globally. And you know, when you have to grow, the first thing you need to do is stretch, right? So this was the intro to the talk. Uh, so I'm Matej de la Corda from CIT Slovenia. We are hosting this panel. We brought you three great speakers uh, who will share their global experience with you. So please be seated, guys. First, we have Bustian Breger. Uh, he is from uh, Fort Office, Mark. Uh, Fort Office is a new kind of inbox uh, who has its own AI email assistant called Scarlet. It's a she, so that you know. Uh, Bustian represents, uh, let's say, um, it's a Slovenian startup who is finding um, its global fit. And I always like to present the speakers also in a more informal way so that you know to get them better, so he, we have a better connection. So what I can tell about you, about Bustian, he's a tech savvy. Like he buys all the new gadget stuff, TVs, mobile apps, so he's on top of things, which he's also developing. He's a big family guy. Uh, he's constantly on Skype from London to his family, and he has four kids, four boys. Like, it's a, it's a mess, right, Bustian? Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Then we have Martin uh, Hank from Pipedrive, you've been listening to. Uh, he represents, let's say, a global successful company in over 140 countries with 30,000 users, right? And a little informal background about him. It's a, he's a funny guy. Uh, you know, I was driving him around Slovenia, and he told me, you know, I'm such an unemployable person, and I'm a terrible salesperson, and he's doing sales CRM. I was like, cool, but... Uh, one specific unique uh, thing about him, he spends over 70 hours listening to audio books every month on topics of business and also a little science fiction. So, good job. <laughs> then our last speaker represents, let's say, the series of successful global startups and tech companies. Kevin Dykes, his informal background, he was a chef, a cooking, a cook expert. He still likes to cook. Uh, he's American who lives in Berlin, uh, moved from, uh, for love reasons, and then doing, start doing business there. Good combination. Uh, he has two kids. Martin has also two kids. And one thing about uh, Kevin, he likes to build uh, badass teams. He, he says, you know, I want to gather around the smartest possible people around me and work with them. So here you have our panelists, and we'll talk about global scaling. And to start with, I want to start uh, simple. Uh, how the hell and when do we say that a global company is a successful global company or even a global company? So I would start with Vistian and just to, uh, ask you directly. It's Ford Office and Mark as a company. Would you define yourself as a successful or a global company? Or where are you? Are you there, not there yet? I mean, it's, um, I think Mark and the other panel said uh, it's hard to, you know, develop a brand and they say, you know, we, we're not there yet, uh, but that's a fact of life. You, you know, a global successful company in our market, you know, you should be adding not 10, not 100, but probably a few thousand users uh, per week, you know. Uh, the, the, the thing they talk about is uh, you should be growing, you know, 2% per week, uh, but not at a number that's 10 or 100, but at a thousand and keep, keep uh, keep, keep, um, around. but, you know, on the other side, as an entrepreneur, I love going to work every day. Uh, I, I still love the journey and, uh, you know, I, I, I listen to Martin and I say, God, there's, you know, we're all having the same stories. Uh, so I think success is uh, something that Martin said before. You actually feel that it's, you're starting to get pulled into something. So, so before success, you're pushing, pushing. And then at some point in time, uh, you know, because I felt it before, you know, you, you just, it's like you, you get drawn into something and you're just trying to, to survive. And currently we're pushing and we're doing uh, a lot of stuff that I think we should have been doing a few years back, but, you know, you had to go through the learning and I'm happy to learn other people had to go through the learning as well. But the, the journey is, 
uh, success when um, you know you start getting pulled into your client base. People actually start loving your product, and it shows. Uh, uh, you know, people come on, and you you go, where did they come from? Uh, you know, how how did that happen? Because it wasn't planned, and and that's really when you know you've got uh, success. We have a little bit of that, but it's not on a scale where you know you'd feel that uh, force uh, happening. Uh, but we're close. We're close. Cool. Now, this is one tip for you. You should all get this monitor Martin was talking about. You know, when you get a new user, it clicks or it clicks, chick bang so that you will know. You will be driven into the, uh, the movement, the force. Martin, you represent, let, let me say, the successful global company. And you killed so much stuff uh, along the way. I was like surprised they killed everything. Uh, if you would like, if you like, look from the perspective from, from the, where you are now, back. What did you do right? Why, what didn't you do wrong? So what would you advise, you know, for, a, let's say, startup who wants to go global? Any bullet points or any, like, advice from you? Yeah, um, so focus is really important. We heard about it yesterday as well. Um, we, what we did right was focusing on the uh, specific segment of small companies uh, selling something expensive, so a um, complex sales model. And that was, we had this... Um, really simple strategy for building the product. Every time we had to choose between a small company and a big company, we would choose the small company. And every time we had to choose between a salesperson and a sales manager, we would say, uh, choose the salesperson. Sounds simple, but it's actually a very useful tool. So every time a big company came to us and said, well, we'll pay you a lot of money if you customize the software and like, uh, we can install it in our servers, we were looking at the uh, like the, the four sentences, and we said, nope, <laughs> we're not going to do that. We want to be global, and we want to scale. So, uh, no. And every time someone came to us and said, well, I want this very specific feature for the sales managers, we said, no, because we want to focus on the sales people. And uh, that really got us very far without having to have a like, more complicated and, and in-depth um, strategy. Another thing that we did uh, well, I think, was uh, localizing early on. And that wasn't really our choice. Um, it was more of a choice of our users. So some startup companies from Brazil found us somehow, and they really liked it. But they also said, well, we have like two people in every company that speak English, but the rest of them really need Portuguese. So you have to localize. And I was like, oh, it's such a big thing to localize a software. But we did it that, and uh, it has been really beneficial in going global. The, uh, um, the Brazilian Portuguese version that we launched, it's uh, getting a lot of use. And then once we had the technical capability, we could do all of the other languages as well, all the big languages like uh, Spanish and Estonian and, uh, and so forth. So uh, now we have more than uh, 3,000 customers from Brazil. It's, uh, and we don't have anyone on the ground. So like, there's no company, no people uh, in Brazil. And the Brazilians are confused about that. Like, how does a small company from Estonia uh, without having anyone on the ground get 3,000 customers from Brazil. It's crazy, but somehow it happened. Uh, the other part was like what we did wrong. What you didn't do wrong. <laughs> yeah. Or you can also tell what, what you did wrong, that you, know, you tell the yeah. audience. Uh, yeah, it's like there's so many things <laughs> we did wrong. <laughs> it's like a hard, to, hard to pick one yeah, that's... That one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, we could have done things more f faster, like focused even better. Uh, yeah, there, there was a lot of uh, like touch and go at first, uh, like trying to figure stuff out, uh, not leaving. Uh, like so some people didn't uh, leave their previous jobs early enough. We, we could have like done all of these things faster uh, if we had focused better and decided that, yeah, we need to really like tap into uh, building pipe drive. Um, I guess, yeah, just being more decisive and like just like really um, putting ourselves um, into this company, we could have done it earlier. So at some point we kind of like got pulled in and uh, after AngelPad uh, there was like really no question. But before that, this, like the first year before AngelPad was kind of like, this, like a little bit like fuzzy. Cool. Hello. Angel support always helps. <laughs> Kevin, you as a chef, what is your secret sauce, you know, for uh, a global company? Yeah, you've been in many, let's say, tech companies, and you moved, you know, from one to another, like in one to two years. 
Is there any reoccurring patterns, you know, structures which you say that work for a global company? What we did with Retention Grid is um, we chose to, uh, to go to market on, on the back of platforms that our customers use. So Shopify, BigCommerce, Magento, on and on, and they are already global, um, and we're able, because what, we're a very data-intensive product, so getting data into our platform is critically important from the first use case, or there's no value there at all. And if you have to rely on them to integrate anything, that would never work. So we chose to do um, uh, a platform strategy, and that's enabled us. We currently, Retention Grid currently has uh, around 14,000 users um, in 60 countries, and together they manage around 30 million uh, customers using the product, and they're in every country in the world. Um, and I don't think we ever could have done that without leveraging other platforms as distribution. Cool, cool. We're getting questions, keep doing that. I'll, I'll get this one later. Uh, I would just like to ask you all the same question. We are always talking about, you know, you have to move abroad, you know, go to Silicon Valley, go to California, and you all moved. And, uh, but we never, never talk about what changed in your perspective. So the question is, what did change in your perspective regarding your global business? So you moved your offices from Ljubljana to London, you moved from small Estonian village to California, you moved to, okay, the States to Germany, it's different stuff. I came backwards. But, yeah. So, Bastian, what changed in your perspective? I mean, I, you know, it's, uh, when you're sort of in a, in a comfortable environment like Slovenia is, it's, uh, you start uh, sort of um, understanding things too well. If, uh, I don't know if I'm making sense, but if you go into London, there's so many different people you meet, so many different sort of perspectives, so many different vibes you hear. You know, there's so much more data that it basically forces you to sort of accept that. In Slovenia, you can be at home and, and listen, and you can be in Ozofa, and you can sort of uh, look at what's happening on YouTube, but it's not the same as if you go out there and you talk with five investors, and you talk with five partners, and you go at what are sort of, uh, you know, the channel partners doing. It, it, it changes your perspective, and, and that's really, uh, uh, you know, number one, because I always say, uh, you know, the top guys, the founders, the few at the beginning, you know, their perspective normally changes. If, if their perspective stays the same, it doesn't work. The second thing that uh, definitely works, um, it's all about the team. And, you know, there's some team talent that uh, you can get there that you can't get everywhere. So in London, um, you know, we work fortunate enough to get a great product guy, which is really hard to get in Slovenia. Uh, we had some sales guys that uh, came on the journey and sort of helped us out. So there are two things. You as a founder have to change and, and as a consequence, being there, listening, getting the frame of mind makes you, you know, open up to, to what you need to do. And, and, and really that's, you know, the number one learning. It's, it's a constant learning experience. Uh, and, and, and you can't do it if, if, if you're doing it within the constraints of an environment you were brought in. It's, it's the same as if you're in a corporate environment. I, I say it's really hard to innovate in a, big, in a big, because you have so many rules, you have so many uh, understandings, you understand everything in Slovenia. London, you know, nobody understands. There's a one and a half hour average commute to go to work, you know, and, and the problems of people commuting is really an interesting problem. We don't have that, so how can you even think about solving that problem without actually, you know, witnessing it, being a part of that, uh, you know, we do a lot of offline work, and for us, we're always, Slovenia is really good in online, it works everywhere, anywhere I go, I've got internet, well, you know, you've got London, has got the underground, and our product didn't, just didn't work in London really well, because we didn't understand that people could work in an environment like in London, and uh, internet was shitty, and, and you had to witness that, and you had to be in that environment to understand all that, because then you get the power of the people, you get people to understand why they're doing it, what's important, and you get them uh, 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 flowing quicker. Cool. I guess you agree. Is there anything to add? Uh, yeah. I mean, there's something in the water in Silicon Valley. So it just like drives people crazy and they, they start believing in all of that stuff. And when you go there and you meet these people and you just like start believing in all of that yourself. And it's really helpful uh, because like, running a startup is like super difficult, obviously. Um, so this deep belief that it's possible, uh, you can achieve all of these like seemingly impossible things. It's uh, it's very helpful, and yeah, having these uh, different perspectives is is really helpful. Also, coming back, I I uh, lived in Silicon Valley for two years and then I moved back to Estonia. Seeing these 
like very different places also helps you understand like how like like all the good things that you have at home um, so some of the things that uh, um, I suffered with <laughs> in the US like uh, writing checks uh, on paper and uh, and filing the tax return and all that crap like coming back to Estonia it's like oh yes like there's a digital <laughs> like <laughs> Uh, life and uh, I don't have to pay like enormous sums for uh, a shitty in internet connection in like Silicon Valley in all of the places in the world. Um, so yeah, the different perspectives are, are super helpful. Cool, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, if, uh, so I came the other direction and I didn't do it specifically for that, but I stayed for that. Um, so I think so many U.S. companies don't think um, past the borders of the U.S. because it's a damn big market to begin with. Um, and they sort of miss the fact that um, there's different European data privacy standards and how do you hire international people. And so in Berlin, you know, we're operating in one of the most stringent data privacy environments in the world. If we can do it there, it's sort of gold standard for the rest of the world. Um, people in the U.S. don't even have a clue that that exists. So I, I, it's been good for us to sort of make ourselves have a structure that really is global in terms of not U.S. first, and then it, it's a lot easier for us to go back into the U.S. because we understand that market and can grow there. Cool. You know, I have to say something to the organizers. These chairs are way too comfortable, so we won't leave the podium. Okay? <laughs> Just that you know. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I'll take this question. I think it's great. So, Bustiano said before that, you know, as a CEO, you have to change yourself in your mentality. But, you know, it also, when you go global, the whole structure changes. So this is a uh, question about structure. How to manage exponential distributed growth, combining ethnic teams and freelancers and still keep a grip on things without everything falling apart? So it's everything, you know, scales, grows. So how do you do you like uh, rent, uh, you know, hire uh, shrinks or what do you do? So that was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> so We've seen uh, many companies these days being like really distributed. Everyone can work from home from any time zone uh, that they want. We don't believe in that. Um, I guess it depends on the company, and I guess if you are really distributed, then everyone needs to be distributed. Uh, in PyTribe, we want to keep people together in offices. <laughs> I know it <laughs> sounds really old school, but that's what we do. So although we have several offices, we, we do expect people to come in um, like they can work from home every once in a while, but um, we've experimented with different things and uh, we just don't see how that would work with us. Um, but yeah, um, and also keeping um, like some critical roles in, in one location, it's just like, uh, it's really helpful. For example, for us, all the development is happening in Estonia, so everyone is in the same time zone. We try doing product development so that the uh, product managers are in California and the uh, developers in Estonia, and it was a total nightmare. Like, don't do that. <laughs> okay. If I may, because it's a, it's an interesting one, and uh, you know, we 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 sell online collaboration, and uh, there is this dream of, of of home working, and we actually allow people to work at home. Uh, but the truth is, when you're sort of in a startup, there's a component about belief and passion, and and passion is something you feel. It's not you you can't have passion on a platform. Um, and, and so, you know, we also have, we have a, a big office in, in, in Slovenia. We just moved into really, you know, an open space type environment. We went from cubicles to everybody seeing everything. And, and it, you can actually sense how sort of the culture changes and how people actually um, didn't communicate before actually start uh, uh, communicating. It's still hard. We're Slovenes. But uh, the, the, the mat matter of the fact is, uh, you know, we think there's a mix between, you know, you will have an office in London. I will get a great product guy that will not want to come to Slovenia. And as a consequence, I need to have sort of some kind of people there, and it is a nightmare. Uh, but you need to make a culture of fun, a culture of collaboration, a culture of where. But at the end of the day, you have to get them together. So, you know, I, I, I tell everybody uh, there's a peak that everybody in our company has a possibility of going to London for three months, and actually they like it, you know. And when they come there, they change, uh, uh, to be honest, because the passion where we work there... There are a hundred startups in that building, and you know you just feel a different uh, vibe, and, and people actually change again uh, for those three months. And and you know it's 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 hard to talk about passion in Slovenia, but it is, uh, and and that's why what Martin said before: when you go into all these foreign countries, 
they believe, sometimes they even believe more than you believe. It's really hard to understand. You come there and you say, okay, I'm, I've, I'm finding Microsoft to inbox and Google. And, and you go in Slovenia and they go, okay, he's a bit crazy. You know, can I touch him and all that? You know, he's going <laughs> to fail. And, and, then, and then you come there and then a VC tells you, wow, you know, uh, yeah, let's do it. You know, let's go for it. Let's try it. And, uh, and, 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 and you, you, you meet another one. And, and that belief uh, fuels the passion. The passion fuels the hard times that we survive, and it's what makes us move forward. And, and I think that is the most important. That's why, you know, if somebody wants to work at home, it's when he really wants to focus on one thing, because I believe in focus. But otherwise, get into the room and work together. And if you think you have to go to London, go to London. If the product guy has to come to Slovenia, I'll always pay for the travel tickets to basically feel, uh, feel the, 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 the environment. Cool. Kevin, your experience with structure? Uh, I've got nothing to add. These guys said it well, I think. Cool. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. When you're in Ljubljana, you have to visit, you know, Bustian's offices. They have like this constructive corner with a, uh, you can write on the walls, but all you have to say is constructive. And they have PlayStations and stuff. It's a good environment, right? The only thing they do is they play football there, I can tell you that. <laughs> it was meant for being constructive, but actually they play a lot of football there. <laughs> cool. Okay. One, one thing troubles me, you know, like during, uh, during podium. So we are... We are listening constantly about the focus and just focus on the user, just focus, focus, focus. But you know, when you like scale globally, you pivot, you change, you, you feel something different, you get it, uh, the other investment. So, and you are like changing all the time in Fort Office. So what do you think, when is the best time to change, how to change, how does this affect your focus, etc.? Please give me a, some solution because I'm so troubled. Uh, uh, you know, I had a lot of people stopping me during the two days and said, okay, tell me the rule of marketing in, 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 this, in this phase. And I said, the rule number one for marketing is you shouldn't have a marketing degree because everything has changed in marketing in the last year. You should actually not be uh, uh, indoctrinated with the marketing from uh, five years. It's really rapidly changing. The one rule I see, and, and you know, I, I think Martin talked about it before, is uh, we used to sort of have this idea, especially our generation, of selling to sort of corporates, selling to businesses, selling to the manager. Uh, it's about the individual. And, and that's really where the change has. And our pivot was not, yeah, we changed the product, but the feature set in half a year is going to be the same as it used to be. But the, the focus, the detail, razor focus of understanding who your individual is, what his profile is, what, why is he doing what he's doing, understanding exactly what his pain is, exactly why he's having that pain. And the fact of the matter, if you're a SaaS business, everybody gives you five clicks. Five clicks. I say everybody gives you five clicks. In five clicks, you can persuade him to give you the next ten clicks, or, or you're out. And five clicks, every single click that's in there that he shouldn't be doing is actually 20% of your uh, conversion going down. And, and really having a razor focus of understanding what that individual user, what that profile is, you always start with a specific. These guys understood sales guys. We are looking at a 30 to 45 who's an email probably on exchange, uh, uh, trying to be a little bit more advanced and using a little bit more of an advanced uh, inbox tool. You know, that's our, and, and what is he doing? We still don't know exactly, but that razor focus on understanding that user, understanding how much you have to kill from the product and how much you have to add from the, that balancing act, it's, it's the only thing I tell because it's so easy to actually say, okay, I'm going to go, Bustan is going to go, and I'm going to sell to a, a, a corporate, a great vision of uh, uh, enterprise collaboration and blah, 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 blah. But that's really selling sort of a different, it's, it's, it's the old way of selling. Now it's about John who's come in, he, he, he's looking for a new email tool, he's got these uh, problems, and within five clicks, you have to persuade him you've actually added something to his. And if you have that focus, it'll take time, it will be a lot of effort, but if you look and you're open and you listen to and look at the data, you will basically improve the conversion rate, which is basically the bottom line. And that's, you know, that was the only learning for some money that we did, you know, go for the user, go for the one individual, understand him, Top right, you know, there's a profile in there you have to understand, like your wife, you know, like your wife knows you. You have to know everything about him. And once you know that, you can understand how to attract him, how to do the marketing to get there. And, and you know, that's, that's the one-liner. That's the one-liner cool. that's uh, uh, the one thing I, I learn, I, I tell everybody, you know, go for the user.
Okay, so focus on the user and pivot around the user. Yes. Cool. Well, yeah, I mean, if you handle change, you need to make sure that you have this one pillar in place that like, you can change the way you do things around th that pillar, but you don't jump around doing everything at once. For example, for us, it's the, the small businesses that have the complex sales model, and we serve them, and we serve the end user, as you said. Like, these, these are the people that are making the buying choice in the small companies. But around that, we can all the time go in and redefine how we do product management. Like we can go in and we can redefine how we do sales or how we do marketing. And we constantly experiment, we change the things. Uh, if you look back, um, every three months, the way we do product management uh, is constantly changing. But we're still making the same product for the same users, so that will remain. Um, so as long as you have this pillar in place, you can, you can experiment. So you don't, but at the same time, you need to be careful that you don't like, start putting Tetris into your uh, sales tool <laughs> just to get the engagement up. Cool. Yeah, I think f uh, what we found, it's, um, we've got users who have you know, been using the product uh, on a regular basis for three years. Um, but the world of the rest of their um, the rest of the world has changed. What other products they're using, the way they see us, what, what role we fill for them. Um, and it's easy for us to sort of maintain that same, we're solving the same problem. Um, so as we got our focus back on retention grid, we, one of the things we learned was um, there was a massive interest in taking advantage of the, the advanced capabilities of the product, um, but no time. Um, and so we, have actually turned into having a, a, a more high-touch, more productized uh, service component that is pretty um, heavy in the beginning. But then we've known, uh, we've had customers using it like that where it just sort of maintains things we wouldn't have thought of before in a, in a SaaS business, in a software business, um, is to sort of not be afraid of, of doing things that, that still have a good margin but that have humans behind it. Um, and, when we started doing some of that, um, before we did sort of deep integrations with things that would automate, we had a guy who was responsible for manual automation. Um, he was the one, he was the monkey in the, in, in the machine actually doing all the work that seemed like was happening by magic, but it saved us a ton of time. Um, he would remind me every month, like, hey, can you fix that, please? But again, sort of not being afraid to do things like that. Um, and you have to adapt if you're going to maintain over years, the rest of the, the landscape will change a lot. Okay, nice. Let us squeeze this question in uh, from user to market. Is it a good idea to validate and test your business idea and product in your country first, or is it better to go global from the start? I normally do uh, hear this question a lot. The seat mentors would normally say, go where the market is. But still, I want to hear your opinions on this as well. So what do you think? Country first, and then go global. Well, I mean, the beauty of country first is you can walk out the door and see someone face to face. Um, so I, I think to me it's less about country. And it, in, the, in the beginning, especially when you're very early phases of a, of, a, of a new venture or very early phases of an idea or a feature, just being in the same room talking to someone, even if they're not necessarily the one you're at, that, that, that's, you can't get that value from a Skype call sometimes. Um, but if you're going to get past the first little bit, you've got to, yeah, you've got to go, I think, much broader than that and go um, because regional differences and regional perspectives will, will change a lot. Yeah. Well, it depends, of course, uh, on the product. So if you have something that you necessarily have to be, uh, like there needs to be a company on the ground. Like you can't go global with Uber, for example, like, uh, because you, you do need to have an office in every city. Uh, but unless you really have to, I would go global uh, since the start. Like, obviously, yeah, you need to meet people and validate the idea um, face to face. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend uh, like doing it like the uh, old times where you start a company in Estonia, you run it for five years, and then you open an office in Latvia. I, I don't think that really is uh, the key to global expansion. That is a key to having a nice little business, but. Uh, Going global after that is like probably very, very difficult. I, I actually think you have to go global as well. I mean, you, you can do a lot of stuff in, in Slovenia, but I think the difference is not really, is it, is it you know, country or something? 
if you ask, if, if I go to a meeting with somebody and I am actually asking him questions, the answers I get are very different to if they do it on their own, you know, behind the wall and they're actually doing what they want because people tend to want to tell you what you want to hear. So if you do a lot of, you know, and, and, and I support going to a few customers every so and then, but it's, it's, you have to go global because you have to see all the different data you, you get back and you have to look at the data, what they're telling you, you know, what the conversion rates are, look at what the interpretation of that is because you're really looking for a profile of individuals. I can always go to a meeting and probably I'll come back and say, why well, I've done a good job, everybody loves the product and then retentions go down because basically what they did was they told me uh, what uh, they wanted to hear. So for me, I think go global, find sort of a profile, again, you know, go user-centric if that's the model. Uh, you can't do every model like that, but uh, go user-centric and, and try to learn without uh, going to uh, too many sort of meetings face-to-face. -face. Go to the face-to-face -face when you have assumptions you want to check and you give them sort of quite closed questions to understand why they did something instead of something else. Okay, let's start the competition. You know, when you go global, you hit the competition sooner or later mostly sooner. So how to deal with competition? You like, ignore them, you like do a complete research about them, you try to go in uh, cooperation with them. So what are your experience? What to do? You mean when you come to Slovenia and you walk into the room and you see Stelly on stage doing a great job? <laughs> we can go in this direction as well. <laughs> yeah, that, that shit can happen. <laughs> but usually uh, most startups get killed like by suicide, not by competitors. So uh, I wouldn't like really like obsess about them too much. Is that like, there's like seven billion people in the world? There, there's enough market for everyone. Cool. Yeah, do your stuff and don't worry about the competitors too much. Okay. I, I hope I won't quote uh, the wrong quote, but I think I read somewhere that Eric Schmidt, so, uh, Schmidt said, uh, "Okay, he's in a different position uh, as CEO of Google, but know your competition, but don't follow them too much because you know you could do a suicide because of." You know, Google's our competitor, so should I look at everything they did? Yes, sometimes I do, but there's the focus is again from the user. I think uh, competition today, uh, you know, there's so many competitors, so many different routes, so many frames, it's, 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 it can distract more than it can uh, help in many, many situations. Uh, so, you know, focus on the user. It's, it's, it's my best advice. Okay. Okay, we are getting out of time. So when you come to the conference like this, you know, you see new startups, you talk to startups, what do you see and what would you like to see? This is the, now your uh, space to give your one-liner, your heart message to the guys over here. Who would like to go first? Okay, take a deep breath, think about it. Yeah, Kevin, now you got like two minutes. Yeah. Well, so as I said before, I'm, I, I'm taking a sort of a counter perspective to a lot of people right now. And if I see a company that I think we want to try and take out, I'm going to go straight to them first um, because there's a sort of special thing happening on the big company side. I don't mean traditional partnerships and other bullshit distribution. But I mean getting into their innovation teams um, right now because they are terrified of what's happening in this room, absolutely terrified, and for good reason. Uh, it's, it's easier than ever to build a big company um, and so it's opening up, it's kind of special opportunities if you're, if you're willing to navigate that process and explore. Thanks. Yeah, so this one thing, like, you keep uh, hearing that you need to get out of the office and meet the user. I would like, just like, take it one step further and get out of your country. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's the one liner. Okay. Uh, have no fear. Uh, you know, w once the living gets out of the country, they find another office and they stay there. So, you know, uh, uh, it's go out, you know, go out. Uh, uh, again, talk with people. You don't have to do it one by one. And, and it doesn't have to be a user. Just go out, get the different uh, uh, frames uh, uh, of mind. Uh, uh, and, and normally it's, it's related to fear. You fear that something will change and that it won't be good and all that. And, um, you know, uh, I think the biggest fear is you stay stuck uh, where you sit today. And uh, that normally means somebody else is going to take your, your seat that's waiting for you in London or San Francisco or somewhere else, and you can actually make an impact and a change. And that's why, you know, just go for it. Cool, thank you. Before you go out, because we will go out and expand and grow, uh, two key messages. Please, Kevin, take one card. Thank you.
So the person who is going with C to London business trip is Matthias Lever at Intech Tief DOO. Matthias will let you know how to come with us. So the last message from me, thank you, Kevin, thank you, Martin, thank you, Christian, you were great. Uh, just one message from Seed, of my personal message. Uh, when you want to grow, you know, in a business sense, don't forget that you also need to grow as a person. So grow as a partner, grow as a parent, grow as a friend, grow as a human being. And with that, you will also grow in your business. So now, thank you. Go out and grow. Thank you.